Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of MCU Rewatch. Once again, if you are unaware, this is basically me going back and rewatching all the MCU movies up to this point. Uh, so this time, I rewatched Spider-Man: Homecoming and Thor: Ragnarok. Though I'll be rewatching Thor: Ragnarok later, but I figured I'd go ahead and just record my thoughts about Spider-Man: Homecoming. So first of all, let's talk about Spider-Man: Homecoming. After rewatching it, like I said, this is my second time watching it. I thought this before, but now rewatching it, I've cemented it in my head that this. This is hands down my favorite MCU movie amongst everything. Just kind of standalones and everything. Once again, that's a little bit biased because Spider-Man is my favorite superhero. So like there's a little bias to that. But after watching, I'm like, this movie is so good. It's so charming. It's still so funny. Like you can, like even rewatching it a second time to which if you've not, like I highly recommend you still, it still grabs you. you still like I still had smirks on my face even though I knew everything that was going to happen because I think what this movie nails and I kind of thought this before but rewatching it kind of helped cement it even more in my head is the fact that the matter is that it, it captures an essence that I feel like no other MCU movie has captured and that's the duality of the whole superhero life like the Iron Man movies capture it a little bit, but that's a little different because Tony Stark's kind of out in the public in like two and three, as well as the Avengers movies and stuff like that. People know who Tony is, as that know him as Iron Man. Since some, like you saw a little bit in one, but I feel like it's a core aspect of Peter's story, both in the comic books, cartoons, whatever the shape, whatever the medium is. It's balancing that life, and I think these movies capture that. I feel like I don't really remember the other movies, whether it be like the original trilogy with Tobey Maguire or the Amazing Spider-Man. Uh, with Andrew Garfield. I don't know if they really captured that. Maybe the first one captured, maybe, did, I don't know. Like, it's a little bit there in the first uh, set of Spider-Man movies, but I feel like this movie captured it. Because as someone who's never really read any comic books, my only experience with Spider-Man is cartoons. I grew up watching a lot of cartoons most of my life when it came to Spider-Man. That's why he's got one of my favorite heroes. I've got the most experience with them. Granted, do I know everything there is, all the storylines that are out there? No, which is why I'm always surprised and nice, happy to see a new storyline kind of pop up about Spider-Man. But nevertheless, I think this captures something that I've never felt. Like, it almost feels like you took an animated cartoon Spider-Man episode and you made it into a movie. It's probably like you... Like, obviously, it's a little more extended, so you can make the argument maybe this is a two- or three-parter that's put together into a movie, or you could very at least be like, no, they took an episode and they kind of extended it, because it's a lot of, like, one concrete story stuff, but it captures that essence so well, that duality of balancing between keeping your secret identity and being a superior. Because I've talked about this before, amongst the MCU, he's the only character that's really done that so far. I mean, arguably, you can say, well, Ant-Man has, but everyone else's identities are just kind of out there in the open, so it's kind of like, he's the only one that has to ever really worry about the secret identity thing. Like, now, rewatching it and thinking about it, like, Ant-Man has, too. Like, obviously, there are other people in the MCU, because I, I remember uh, the video when I was talking about that was like this. Uh, technically, the first person in the MCU to probably do that was maybe Daredevil having the whole secret identity thing, but once again, that's the TV shows, it's the movies, nevertheless. Because this is just such a an amazing movie because I think once again Spider-Man has such a unique aspect of combat because it also adds in that kind of like comedy element in this movie and just like it's, it's so charming it's so amazing I'm gushing over because I never got to gush over it the first time I actually watched a movie because uh, I never recorded my initial thoughts of it I thought a little bit here afterwards about it but it like if you're watching it it just got me super hyped and I'm like it's so good and you can't help but say Tom Holland nailed it but it's not just him the entire cast from top to bottom. Ned is hands down probably the best sidekick in the uh, MCU, in my personal opinion, because for one, he's the one that's like, dude, you're a superhero. That's the coolest thing ever. And he's the one that tries to convince Peter to kind of like, yo, try and like use some, like score some brownie points off of this, like getting good with Liz and Flash, who kind of treats you like an asshole. You know, trying to spin it in a positive way. Uh, I love the constant jokes about Marissa Tomei as Aunt May, it's just kind of, everyone's just been like, yeah, May, oh man, your aunt's so hot. Like everyone's super hitting on her and everything like that. She's kind of oblivious to it. I guess that's kind of feeding into the jokes a lot of people had about it in the first place when she was originally cast. Because they're like, Marissa Tomei can't play Aunt May. She's too hot. That's kind of like, and that's not me joking. That was a lot of people's initial reaction when that originally casting note came out. They're like, she can't be Aunt May. No way. She's too pretty to be Aunt May, which is, which is such a backhanded compliment to anyone else that has portrayed uh, Aunt May before. 
Because I think one version of Ant-Man, at least that I'm aware of, at least media-wise, I think it's Ultimate Spider-Man. I think that one kind of borderlines in kind of comparison to what Marissa Tomei's is. Because that Spider-Man, I mean, and uh, Ant-Man and that Spider-Man, at least the cartoon uh, version, I, like I said, not counting comic books, not on comic books, but in that adaptation, like, she was very active. She was kind of an outgoing person, you know. It's, it was kind of a different interpretation of Ant-Man, so I thought that was kind of pretty neat. And I think that's what this kind of does, too. Obviously, the, like... The whole story of Peter doing everything he can to try and impress Tony. It's kind of, it does kind of fall on Tony's, uh, Tony's head a little bit. Yeah, Tony handles stuff, but he should have at least told Peter. But because to Peter was trying to do everything he could, because what did you tell him? It's like, oh no, no we'll, we'll call you. Because he was so trying to rush to impress you, to be an Avengers, to feel like he was much bigger than all, like find, you know, find a bigger purpose, that he ended up getting himself mixed up in all of this, you know? So, so that kind of falls on Tony, but at the same time, it is just Peter just kind of getting a big head and just trying to do too much you know he is a kid after all and that element is something someone had talked about after like I heard someone talk about it after the movie and I thought they nailed it in the sense of like you feel the weight of the fact is that he is a kid he's only 15 years old and so when you see that scene where like all of the building is crumbled on top of him and you're he, he, he begging for help and like someone had talked about how that hit them even I was like yeah that kind of got you because you're like all right this is a kid this is a teenager dealing with this because everyone else in this superhero universe like i said he's a first teenager hero everyone else is a full-grown adult so they kind of know what they're signing up for he doesn't even a fight with vulture is vicious like he's like i'm going to kill you kid it's like you're kind of forgetting the fact is that you're fighting a kid it's like you're in my way you're kind of trying to be a man then you get treated like a man you know type of thing so it's just so fascinating and i, I think that's such a good element to this story to kind of add that weight to it to add that stress to it because even though you're not oh it'll work out in it like the first time i watched this movie i was like whoa i didn't know he got this messed up especially when vulture's like picking him up and looking at him and he looks like he's kind of unconscious like it's like man i was like that fight with vulture is brutal kind of getting all banged up like that and he's just slamming you on the ground. I was like, that's brutal. I, I thought it was kind of a nice twist too with Vulture. He isn't like a full on villain. Like obviously his motivation for everything goes back to just kind of like wanting to take care of his family is what this is all about. But to be fair, it's like, no, it's beyond that. You could have done, I'm sure doing all that you did, you probably got enough money to do what you needed to do, but it's just, you probably got a little rush out of it. But at the same time, his motives were kind of misguided yet pure because it was all about his family. I mean, there are even moments where it's like, you see him in a, a different side, like a villain that is reluctant to do what he's doing. Because in the case of like, he was like, oh, I'm gonna kill Spider-Man. But then he found out about the whole DC situation, knowing that Liz was involved in that, it changed his mind. Like he was like, okay, I'm not gonna kill you, kid. Because it's like, well, at least when it came to Spider-Man, that's he never actively tried to kill Spider-Man after that because of what Spider-Man did. And that's even why he was kind of like letting Peter go, even though he knew Peter knew who he was and he knew what Peter was. And that's another element, like, like I said, to this duality of that suspense of like, oh, you know who he is because of Liz saying all this stuff about you disappearing at the time Spider-Man pops up. He figuring it out, it adds his element to it. Once again, the element that Liz is his daughter. And, and rewatching it, you knowing that just makes it still kind of tense because you hear like, oh, uh, Shocker, Shocker 2.0 walking down the halls and being like, man, the, and him and the dude are like, yeah, the boss would be so upset and found out where we were. It's like now that, at, that adds context and that you're like, oh, man, they were t hinting at it even back then. It's like, oh, it's so good. One of my favorite scenes has to be the boat scene because obviously it's reminiscent of the scene from Spider-Man 2 when he's trying to stop, stop the train. I think this is a little more... It's impressive because that's at least him in front of the train trying to hold it. It's like this is him webbing all the structure points. He almost had it. He was 98% way there. But then him trying to hold the boat together like that I think was pretty impressive. Like not trying to compare feats and everything like that. But it's just kind of like just the tension and just like ooh. Just how crazy that uh, fairy situation got was pretty neat. Another favorite thing about this movie I really love is Karen. Which if you did not know this was something I ended up finding out much later on from somebody else was that and I looked it up when I was rewatching it because I was like, oh, was that person, just to make sure that person wasn't mistaken. Turns out, no, the person who voices Karen is actually Jennifer Connelly, which is interesting on many levels because I usually don't really care too much about celebrities who they married and stuff like that just because I'm like, you know, it's their business. I feel all weird when I pay too much attention to who they're with and everything. But apparently her and Paul uh, Bittany are together. I had no idea. I was like, oh man, that's so cool. Uh, turns out, who obviously is Vision, which is funny because they kind of reference it in the movie where it's like, oh yeah, Peter, your room's going to be right next to Vision. 
I, maybe that's not what they were planning, but I thought it was kind of neat. But also, like, it's because, you know, that's kind of neat to tie in like that. But I'll, I'll also not forget, Jennifer Connelly played Betty Ross in the Ang Lee Hulk movie with Eric Bana. So I thought that was kind of kind of tying her back in to the whole Marvel thing. It was so pretty um, awesome. But just the conversations her and Peter have, and she's just kind of, like, trying to motivate him, especially the scene with uh, Liz, which... Interestingly enough, he's upside down, which you can't help but think a little bit of like, oh, the Mary Jane thing of like, oh, you're upside down kissing. So it, kind of, it makes you wonder like when they were making this movie, did they pull references from other movies like that? Or is that just me reading too much into that? Like that makes me think of a uh, Spider-Man 1 movie because him and Mary Jane kissing upside down. And then in 2, obviously the train thing makes me think of the fairy situation in this one, you know. I mean, this is also the first Spider-Man movie with a superhero crossover, in a sense, like someone else. Obviously, the movies have always been just Spider-Man, and this is like him and Tony. Like, Tony's in it a little bit here and there, but obviously, and I think people are talking about it, and that's such a neat thing aspect to it, is the fact is that Tony doesn't take up the movie. He pops in, kind of does his thing a little here and there, but he doesn't completely steal the scene from Peter. Because it kind of plays into the fact that he's still an amateur at all of this. That the fact of the matter is he's still going to need help in the whole friendly neighborhood and uh, Spider-Man aspect of trying to, you know, just stay on the ground, kid, you know, but still. And I think that's, and I talked about this before too, about this moving cotton of being different from other MCU movies in a sense of the fact is that it is a smaller scale movie. Whereas everything else kind of feels bigger in the MCU, this is a very, like, isolated movie, much like Ant-Man. I talked about that too, like, they're very isolated stories. They don't have, like big impacts to a certain extent they do and they don't you know so obviously still love everything with uh Hannibal Burris I just be like oh yeah this dude's probably you know he's a war criminal so we probably shouldn't be playing this but he's like oh the state kind of says that I have to it's whatever uh the freaking Captain America videos are great Martin Starr which I made a reference to that because he's also in the Hulk movie which is kind of another interesting thing not the uh, 2008 Hulk movie the Incredible Hulk movie uh where he um he's only in it for a little bit but uh um, the one with Edward Norton, that's the one I'm referencing, but nevertheless. Then there's the whole thing with Liz, and once again, kind of nailing that Spider-Man experience is the whole, like, with, greater power, with great power comes great responsibility in the sense of, like, he's trying to do the right thing. It's like, oh, here's the girl you like who you want to be with and everything, but choosing to do the right thing over being with her. Like, obviously, when they were at the decathlon, um, decathlon and she's like, oh, let's go to the pool and everything. He's going to, I mean, to be fair, you could be like, well, he has ulterior motives because he's trying to do the right thing because he's trying to hook up with the Avengers and stuff like that. But at the same time, it's like, you, you can still make the argument because everything he's done, because at the end, it's like, he could have just like stayed with Liz knowing what he knew, but he's like, no, I can't. I can't let him get away with what he's trying to do. He's a bad guy. He needs to be stopped. It's not about impressing Mr. Stark anymore. This is just about doing the right thing. He's a criminal and he needs to be stopped. And it's just kind of sad because it's one of those instances that, you know, you just you can't, you don't get the girl in the end of the day. Like, no matter what, you know, she will never know what you've done. Like, I mean, hell, the fact that it matters, you even saved her dad. You didn't have to, but that shows what kind of person you are. That even when it was all said and done, the dude that is threatening to kill you and everyone you love and hold dear you still save him in the end because you're a good guy and just like no one will ever know except for aside from ned uh happy as well as tony no one will ever know what you did that day and i think peter's kind of okay with that it's like oh if i'm celebrity of spider-man that's kind of cool and neat but he doesn't let it go to his head anymore you know because now it's just kind of like the realization that he doesn't just need this suit that he is spider-man and i think that's something that took tony a long time to learn too like it, it wasn't until the third movie that he really kind of learned that, you know, so because that's the whole point. It's like, I don't want you to be just like me. I want you to be better than me. Don't, you know, but every superhero has their faults and their mistakes. Um, obviously, because a lot of people are happy that this isn't an origin story because it was already set up in Civil War. There was no Uncle Ben situation, which could pop up in the future, but and see what that could tie into and what they can make that. But it's like. For now, it's just kind of like, yeah, it's already kind of established. It's already happened. That's why Aunt May's so like, hey, don't. I know you're sneaking out. The fact of the matter is I called you like five times. I didn't know where you were. Obviously, she'd be freaked out because it's like, for one, you're a 15-year-old, so she's worried about she loves you. But it's also because after losing Ben, it's like, obviously, she's going to like lose her mind if you just, you know, obviously, that's why she tried so hard to like, oh, I need to find you. Like, especially everything that's going down now in the city. Like, you know, so... Another favorite thing is the whole conversation uh, he has with uh, Aaron Davis, uh, Donald Glover's character, which, interesting enough, another thing I didn't find out until someone had pointed out uh, to me, like, after I'd seen the movie, was like, his character, that's uh, Miles Morales' uncle in the comic books, that character, which, because he's like, oh, I got a nephew out here, too, which is like, oh, that's so interesting, which the fact is they set that up makes me think, 
because I think this is, I think I remember reading that this is like storyline wise, like obviously it's kind of its own thing, but I think it's pulling from the ultimate Spider-Man universe, which is sad when you actually think about it because like, you know, like that's one of the few comic book things I remember like how the whole Miles Morales thing kind of came to be. It's sad and I mean, once again, it depends on what the MCU does because the MCU is going to kind of do its own thing. But it's already kind of establishing the fact is that Miles Morales is already existing in this universe. But then let's not forget there's already the Spider-Verse thing. And eventually, if those ever like cross over that in the Venom movie, that all depends on how well everything does going forward. Which I'm very excited for the Venom movie and the Spider-Verse movie. I think they're going to do amazing, but that's just me. Like, obviously, we'll have to wait and see in the long run what that ends up being, you know? Some other things, too. For one, the whole Shocker C, where it's like... Oh, the first shocker where it's like, oh, like Vulture's like, oh, that wasn't the anti-gravity gun? It's like, no, that one's over there, not that one. And it's like, oh, well, I killed him. It's like, well, you're the new shocker now. So that's pretty neat. Just kind of like, oh, yeah, here's this established villain who's that guy who first plays him. It's like Logan. I can't remember his name. I've seen him pop up in a lot of movies. I think the most recent thing he popped up in was uh, that movie Upgrade. But, um... Yeah, he was shot. I think his character is probably like the traditional shocker, but the other dude, shocker too, kind of taking over. So that's pretty neat. Like I said, this also sets up like, man, Spider Man already had like two villains kind of pop up in this. Obviously, shocker wasn't that big of a deal because Ned came in with a save in the end. Go Ned. But also, uh, Vulture's still alive at the end. Plus, uh, God, I'm, it's, it's Michael something and it's going to bother me. The actor uh, who talks to him at the end of the movie, obviously, like, he played, what's what's his name? Is it Voss uh, from Far Cry 3? He's like the main antagonist of Far Cry 3. Uh, he's, all, he's also Vic from Orphan Black. So those are two things I kind of best know him from. I, another thing I found out after, because like someone had hinted, like there's a villain if you actually know your Spider-Man villains. There's some sprinkled in there that you'd realize who they are. That guy at the end is actually Scorpion. I had no idea, which is pretty neat, like already establishing those enemies. And also the fact is Vulture knows exactly who Peter is, but he's not telling anybody because it's like, I guess for him, no matter what the situation is, it's like, I guess it's kind of like, I still owe you because like first we're, we're even Stevens because you saved Liz, so I saved your life rather than killing you. Okay, we got even Stevens and then I tried to kill you, but you saved me, so here I am saving you again. You still get my way in the future, I will come after you, but I guess this is his way of saving Peter. Because once again, that's another thing of like, man, there's this one enemy that knows who you are. Everyone else in the world knows who everyone else is in the MCU. Like I said, like Peter is the only established like secret identity thing, once again, with the exception of Ant-Man and oh, there's like Daredevil in the sun and sits with like the TV shows, so. I know I am just going on and on about it, but I still cannot believe how amazing this movie still is even the second time through it just makes me so excited especially because obviously there's the new news about like uh the new title for uh the next spider-man movie being spider-man far from home and that whole situation so it makes even more it's like oh, dude what are you gonna do about that movie i'm so hyped for it you know and that's still a long ways away so a few extra things i wanted to add in on that in there for one love the little school announcement thing they're just you see the little things in the background that i really appreciate just kind of like how terribly shot and weird and edited they are i feel like i liked them the first time through but the second time through i kind of appreciated them there's all obviously i forgot to talk about it and i'm still like such an asshole for it. it's the mj situation which once again i don't know how most people felt about it but i think zendaya did an amazing job as michelle just because she's kind of sarcastic and i've never really known like you know my experience with mj she's never really been like that but for her to be kind of sarcastic and kind of a bit of an asshole in some regards i really like it because even rewatching it i'm like i caught on some certain things because she's like oh yeah peter's kind of not going to the decathlon obviously because of the whole uh stark internship but she's like oh yeah but didn't you quit this this and this and then everyone turns and looks at her she's like i'm not you know obsessed with her or anything it's just i'm very observant and even at the end when she's like what are you hiding, Peter? I'm just kidding. I don't really want to know. And then he's walking away. And she's gone. So it's like, there's a part of me that thinks like, oh man, there, there is some part of you that does actually care about him and like him. And maybe he's just kind of oblivious to it because he's so into Liz that he kind of didn't see it. Or maybe it's just the fact is that you really, that she does like care about it. It's kind of worried because she sees like, oh yeah, like maybe feeling out, figuring out the whole Liz thing didn't kind of work out. And then also just kind of like, you know, the trouble he's kind of gotten into. You know, I think on some level she is kind of worried and concerned about him, which part of me is just like, I'm so curious to see where that goes in the future. Because like like I said, I oh, like the first time through, I kind of just like, oh, does she have a thing for Peter? Which now I'm kind of like, well, now it might just be more so a friend thing because she ends up, she tries to pretend like she's kind of like the outsider and just kind of the loner, but she kind of hangs with Ned and Peter because I think they're the closest thing she's ever really had to friends beside the whole like, um, 
group, you know, that wanted the Capilon and everything that she's a part of and they're a part of. I love the fact is that she doesn't even have detentions, but she's there drawing sad faces of both the coach and Peter. And then the whole situation of like, yeah, I'm not here to represent something, you know, celebrate something that was most likely built by slaves. And Martin starts Garrett telling me, but not, and there's no way that the, the monument was built by slaves. And he turns and there's like a security guy got like, like eh. and he's like, okay, well, you, you enjoy yourself. So I thought that's kind of pretty neat. And it's like, dude, cause she's like one of those characters and it's not like a huge part of the movie, but she's kind of there kind of playing her part. And I think she nails just being there. Just kind of like the kind of like, I'm too cool for this, but it makes me cool because I'm too cool for this. And like I said, she's kind of a sarcastic ass. So at least that's how I'm interpreted. Maybe other people didn't interpret, but I liked her being very sarcastic and kind of having this dry wit to her. I think it's such uh, nailed it. And another interesting thing, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about is damage control. Now it's funny to me because I'm fairly certain that this is in fact the first movie that damage control was in because I rewatched all the other movies and I don't remember that are coming up but this is the first one which I find interesting because damage control the first time I ever came like came in contact with them was actually in the ultimate spider-man cartoon so it's funny that something spider-man related also like it pops up in something first time it pops up it's in something spider-man related in the MCU where it's like the same thing applied it's just kind of serendipitous how that worked out because in the uh, ultimate spider-man basically him uh, and the team he was working with you know white tiger iron fist nova uh luke cage power man were all uh causing so much damage and then they had to spend time with damage to control who handles those types of things and it's kind of neat to know that they're kind of in the background i'm curious to see whether they kind of have a bigger spot or role going forward we see kind of like more things focus on them maybe on the spider-man front because he is more kind of your friendly neighborhood spider-man so he's kind of on the ground level so maybe he could potentially handle that more in the future i don't know that's just kind of some last minute things I wanted to talk about. So. And now moving on to my rewatch of Thor Ragnarok. Thor Ragnarok still holding up as, even, even as someone like me who enjoyed like Thor's one and two, which I know I'm kind of in a minority and that most people are just kind of bleh about the other Thor movies. I really liked him. I still say hands down Thor Ragnarok is the best one. Even rewatching it, I feel like I appreciated it even more rewatching it, just how bright and vibrant the movie is. Because I had talked about that when I was rewatching Guardians. That was like, I didn't realize it the first time, just how bright and vibrant it was. Because I thought the first movie to really do that was Ragnarok. Turns out not the case. But in this one, I feel like it kind of went beyond even Guardians because like from top to bottom, from like building designs and some of the costumes and stuff everything just seemed brighter because everything related to Thor kind of had like a darker look to it I mean I guess in Dark World everything kind of had more but it wasn't like certain aspects obviously when you come to the Bifrost that's kind of colorful but just everything from top to bottom was very colorful obviously this is the big transition because it's like obviously a lot of the MC movies have a little humor to them but this was like main transition into a heavy comedy mixed it it's like Whereas everything's kind of a lot of drama, a little comedy, it's just kind of a lot of comedy, a little bit of drama in, uh, in certain regards. Uh, uh, certain things, rewatching it, I uh, like for, at first, cause I was like, what made him decide to go back home and find out that Loki was take, had taken over the throne? It's like, no, 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 no. Was the fact it was Suter that kind of throw it out there. It's like, oh yeah, your dad's not at home. And he's like, wait, what's up with that? Then he gets there, he sees the play. Plus the fact is that the nine realms are in complete and utter chaos now. I was wondering what that was about. Cause I was like, why did that happen? Like you were all those like two years dealing with that. It's basically, he spent the past two years looking for the infinity stones, no luck. The nine realms were arming themselves up because either they knew Odin wasn't alive anymore, even though Loki was pretending to be him, but it's more likely probably like, no, like he wasn't really being as authoritative as um, Odin was about the whole situation. So the others just kind of probably riled up their armies without question, you know? So, I mean, Loki was so, aspect about being like a great leader and stuff like that but he still kind of let that slide that all of the nine realms were going to be coming after them so um obviously these are one of my favorite parts of this movie is still everything that happens with thor it's kind of crazy to think about like mjolnir being broken and stuff like that because it, it's such a heavy aspect of his character and i think that's so interesting because I mean, I don't know, maybe Mjolnir's been broken before in a comic books like that, but it's just like, it's almost seemed like that was an unstoppable thing and it was broken by Hela so easily. And you'd, for him, that's always been a means of like summoning his powers and without it, he always felt helpless, but obviously, and I kind of referenced this during his vision of Age of Ultron, like the fact is he's covered in electricity. When I rewatched that, I pointed out, I was like, oh, that's so interesting. Cause that's very reflective of Ragnarok, how like he goes full blast in Ragnarok. So it seems like a lot of that does kind of come into play in that regard. I, I wonder is that why they kind of made Heimdall blind? 
because technically he is blind for a lot of the movie because he's not really there being the head of, you know, the Bifrost. I mean, he never officially goes blind or anything, but because he's not at the center for, he doesn't see everything coming because he's on the run because Loki knows that Heimdall would be the one to kind of see through him. So I was like, oh yeah, everyone hunt down Heimdall. You know, he needs to go on trial, blah, 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 blah you know, reasons, so. But seeing him kind of go all like full god like that twice, once against his battle with the Hulk, which is kind of a badass moment, him just summoning it up, and everyone's just like, whoa. Like, even like doing a supercharged punch against all. Part of me wonders is like, if the fight had continued, would he have won? I think part of me is like, the way he's like, oh, easily, I don't think so. But I feel like a lot of that fight, he pretty much had the upper hand, but if it wasn't the Grandmaster interfering, I don't know, it's hard to say because the Hulk is stupid powerful, especially like the angrier and angrier he gets, the more powerful he gets. So, something I think that this movie kind of of nails with everything it does well one kind of small thing is how the trailers deceive you a lot like there's a lot of stuff that was completely like lies in the trailer like and someone had pointed it out afterwards it's like oh yeah remember in the trailer like when he summons up his god powers like the power of thunder on um asgard he has both of his eyes but obviously in the movie he lost his eye by that point in time and then there's a place where helena uh hella destroys mjolnir like in the trailers, it looked like it was like a street or an alley, but it was actually a plane in the movie. That might have been like, in, some of that might be in a teaser too. It might not have been in an official trailer. It might have just been stuff. Some of that might have been in a trailer, uh, teaser. I mean. So to me, the little things like that is also interesting, which may also got to give major props to uh, Kate, uh, Kate Blanchett for playing Hela. I think she does a very good job because there's even moments where even Hela kind of has like dialogue and the dude's like, whoever you are. And she's like, whoever I, did you not listen to me when I just explained to you who I was? Also, like, and maybe, maybe this is just me because, I mean, she's naturally a stunning, beautiful, and very extremely talented actress, but there's also part of me that's like, she looks really good as Hella with just, like, the black hair and, like, the makeup and stuff. It's like, oh, that really looks, that look looks really good on her, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know why. I just, like, she just looks exceptionally beautiful in that role. I know, I feel weird saying that, but it's just, I'm putting it out there, no, nonetheless. Never lost. I do really like her abilities, though, because the fact that she's able to just, I mean, it's never really explained. It's just kind of like, oh, she does it. I guess you don't really need explanation for her just kind of throwing blades out. I mean, it doesn't seem like just blades. She can create anything, but blades are kind of like her go-to thing. But, like, she can just summon an infinite amount of them. And also, you gotta give props to the fact that she was able to do something that no one has ever been able to do. She took Asgard like that. Killed all the soldiers. Killed all Thor's friends. We never got to see Jamie Alexander's character there, but it's kind of probably implied that she died, too. Because I was because I was like, I didn't remember like all his friends died, but it's like, nope. First two people she kills when she gets on Asgard are his two friends. And then the final dude is another friend of his. And then there would be Jamie Alexander's uh, character, but I guess, you know, uh, scheduling conflicts. Because at this time, she was she's still doing Blind Spot, especially at the time this movie was coming out. She was probably doing Blind Spot too. So, I mean, not probably, was definitely doing Blind Spot at the time. So probably, uh, scheduling error but we probably would have seen her like die too not unless she was off world i don't know oh those three were on earth world so i kind of figured she would be as well so i mean because the last time we did see her was in thor too because that was like before she started doing blind spot like i said it's probably one of those things where it's like yeah she probably died technically off screen but once again like i said she just, she ended up wiping everyone out easily like no one has been able to like conquer asgard and as swiftly as she did single-handedly and it's almost like this deadly grace to it like the way she she floats around and moves and flips around just slices through people it's like whoa obviously you got jeff goldblum as the grandmaster still love him just like oh, oh, oh the slaves are rising up no, 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 don't i don't like that word mainframe I don't, why would i care about the word mainframe no 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 the s word find prisoners who have jobs or something like that he's like no that sounds much better then the whole thing about like oh you're and it starts with a b trash why would, no, you, were you just waiting to say trash? Just like Jeff Goldblum, as most people say, gold blooming it up, but still fantastic. He survives at the end of the movie. Obviously there's a whole revolution, but I think that sets up like, hey, we could easily see uh, the Grandmaster pop up later on in movies. I, I really appreciate it. Gonna see that character come back in some shape or form. I'd also forgotten how much of a drunk Valkyrie was. Like, I mean, to be fair, when you're in her circumstances, well, I mean, to be fair, it's also an Asgardian thing. Asgardians just drink like crazy anyway, but also it's kind of a way of forgetting her past and stuff like that. So, but just like her first time popping up i completely forgot she fell off like that and it's like hey if you want him you have to get through me but we've already got him and she's almost got you almost, almost has that look like 
damn it, you have a point. She's like, fine, then I'll go through you. And those poor bastards got obliterated by her ship like crazy. I'm also wondering, would that have ever been anything like the whole Valkyrie and Hulk thing? It might just be that they're good buds because it's like, oh, angry girl, and she kind of played around with Hulk and everything, especially the whole her and Bruce thing. She's like, I feel like I know. He's like, I feel like I know you, especially because, like, wow, what are those markings on her face? Is that the number of people she's killed? God, she's so beautiful. It's just so funny he would say all that. I'd also forgotten that Thor was kind of trying to do the thing that uh, uh, Black Widow does in um, Avengers Age of Ultron, trying to like the whole oh, the sun setting bit guy, you know, that whole speech. Part of me wonders, did that not work just because he was in that form for so long? Or was it more so because it was coming from Thor? I feel like it more so that way, because the only person it really worked for was Natasha. And it's kind of sad when he sees the message and stuff, like the last time we know that they've had any interaction with, between each other. So we never get a good look at it, but I guess it's kind of like that whole thing of like, if you probably want a good idea of potentially what might have happened, probably just probably pop in like the movie uh, Planet Ho, which I've still never actually seen that. Uh, it's kind of what this is kind of building upon, which uh, this is something I meant to bring up earlier, but I think what this movie nails multiple in multiple ways. For one, it's the buddy comedy aspect of like at putting these two superheroes together in a movie like this. Uh, it's kind of interesting, especially right after like Spider-Man Homecoming happened because it had Iron Man and Spider-Man working together, but obviously that was more so Spider-Man saying Iron Man just kind of popped up here and there. But this is full on like Banner and Slash Hulk is there with Thor. Um, even like, but it's just kind of putting them together in kind of this duo situation. I feel like it's never really happened in any of the, like, the solo movies before now. So I thought they kind of added an interesting element. Like I said, with the exception of Spider-Man Homecoming. So it's kind of interesting to have those movies like that to that. But also adding in Doctor Strange. And that's one of those other things that make this whole MCU thing great. Because you didn't even have to have characters pop up for the full movie. He's literally in the movie for maybe five minutes and I think that's so beautiful to this whole thing because you could have those crossovers without it being like a big thing even in the tv shows like legitimately like kind of using a more recent example it's Luke Cage season two you had literally Danny and uh Colleen from Iron Fist pop in each for one episode each not like a big deal they have their part to play in the story and then they just bounce like out of 13 episodes that's two characters out of the end in two different episodes all together for you know it's just something like that it's just so fascinating but it's like because it's kind of like that with ant-man and falcon i mean to be fair that kind of had plot relevant relevance because that eventually led to like oh because falcon became aware of him because of their confrontation and ant-man it's like which led to him being like yo i got the perfect dude who can help us without this within this whole situation and then you know you know you could arguably be like well this is set up for that i mean this is like well this is before infinity war so that says that but eventually there could be even more tie-in with dr strange and i mean especially because we are talking on a more magical more cosmo cosmic level of things so obviously that'd be probably tie it into that regard as well but like i said it's just like this five minute thing it, and it's such a little thing that you wouldn't think much of it because he's just like oh i know where your father is i'd also completely forgotten that uh Odin was like, yeah, he apparently, I'd assume the spell was basically Odin made him, either made Odin forget that he was Odin, that he was just some crazy old dude. Probably kind of did to Odin what Odin did to Thor and Thor 1. Not made him forget, but maybe just seem like a senile old man, not really having any powers, can't prove he's a god. Or maybe it's just kind of sealing away who he really is and making him just think he's just some average Joe. So that's kind of interesting. Like, there's so much that's happened in between Thor 2 and now. There was this really nice line between Thor and Loki I thought was kind of nice. Because for him, it's like, he's like, oh, you know, you have your opinion of me. He's like, brother, I used to have, think, uh, think the world of you. He had such high hopes for his brother because it's like, I thought we'd be fighting side by side together. Whereas he had all this, like, resentment and hatred towards Thor. And Thor never had that. It's just kind of like, you're my brother. Like, I thought we'd be... Like, oh, Thor and Loki going into battle, but it's like, no, you betrayed me time and time again. I'm me and you're you. There's no thing that's ever going to change that. Maybe there's some good in you, but, you know, part of me was like, I don't know if I'm. it's really worth it. Especially because it's like, oh, Loki, you're so predicted. We're trying to betray me. It's like, oh, here I am. I, you know, we go in circle and circle. I believe you. You try to balloon up, like, you know, betray me. It's like, we need to grow, which Thor himself has grown many times over over the course of the movies and stuff like that so but you do see that look in loki's eye where there is a bit of like almost feeling disappointed in himself it almost because he almost feels bad for letting thor down which is kind of interesting all the times he's tried to kill him and everything so uh, i love the fact is that banner's just there freaking out because it's like well you'd be freaking out too when you basically have two years of your life going and then there's a whole aspect of like oh man on top of all of that i mean to be fair i think that it's hard I'm, I'm, it makes you wonder 
when he left at the end of Aven uh, Age of Ultron, was that him making that decision or was that Hulk or was that a combination of the two? I feel like it's probably more so Hulk if he doesn't really remember because he's asking where's Nat. So I'm kind of like, yeah, it must be more so the Hulk was just like, yeah, I'm more of a danger and I won't be good for you to have around kind of too much of a burden so it's something i never thought about at the time but now having rewatched it and looking at him the fact is oh yeah like you're, you weren't the hulk and everything i mean you've been the hulk for the past two years meaning that that time you weren't banner when you made that decision potentially like i said not unless something kind of bled over into the hulk i mean they are kind of like same side different sides of the same coin it is kind of crazy in the end that this is all started by the fact is that they have to be the ones to create ragnarok uh, by destroying, um, I mean, I, it's heavily implied that she's dead, but I, part of me always kind of feels like, I was stuff like that, it's like, yeah, it's implied that she's dead, I assume she's dead, but there's always part of me like, oh, maybe she survived, I don't know, I mean, I highly doubt it because all of Asgard got destroyed, which is kind of sad, like, you, I mean, like I said, going back to the whole aspect of what that dream sequence set up, it's like, oh yeah, that you will be the destruction of it, it's like, yeah, he did, was part of the reason why Asgard was destroyed. I love that the Hulk tried to fight and he's like, stop it, you idiot. He's like, but Hulk's like, big monster. He's like, come on, and you almost see him get pissed. Like, mm, tell me what to do. Like, he doesn't say that, but you almost get that vibe from him. I thought that was so good. This movie is just so funny. Like, it does such a good job. Like, these characters that you normally probably see themselves taking themselves a little too seriously, you could be making the argument that's what some people could see the first two movies being. And you see them kind of not taking themselves as seriously. Even these serious moments kind of get have a little comedy. And I remember that being something someone had uh, complained about. Even, like, the serious stuff was still kind of added in with comedy elements and stuff like that. So I do remember, um... I, I think he had said it in an interview or something, or at least I heard it from someone saying he said it in an interview, but it, uh, Ty Kidd had said if he ever was brought back for another Thor movie, depending on whatever Thor's future ends up being in a grand scheme of this whole MCU thing, what that ends up turning into, uh, that he would do another Ragnarok. Like, he would do a Thor Ragnarok too. Like, he'd keep a, probably a lot of the tone the same, so. I know, I, I think that'd be kind of interesting. I mean, where would you kind of go from here now that, like, Asgard's technically going. I mean, all your people are still there, but beyond that, like, I'm curious, like, what's next for their people, you know? What's happening and eventually what's going to happen later on. It's actually kind of crazy when you actually do look at it in the grand scheme of things, how much Odin did lie about everything. First, it's about Loki. Then there's a the whole ether situation, and it's just like now about your sister. It's like, man, Odin kept a lot of secrets. But to be fair, maybe that's because he was hiding his own past, he's his own shame, because like he hid his own daughter away, even though he used her as a weapon, and she like they all uh, caused mass destruction and massacred so many enemies and people that stood in their way. But Odin had a change of heart, and he tried to instill that change of heart into Thor. It's kind of like, I don't want you to be me, I want you to be better. It's kind of why he pushes Thor as much in his heart as he want, as he does, because I guess because he saw, because he always saw too much of himself in Thor. Probably saw a lot of himself in Loki, even though that wasn't his biological kid and everything. I mean, it makes you also wonder, well, Thor, do you have any other secret siblings kind of lying out there? I'd assume not. Not unless Loki has some out there, but I mean, he killed his biological dad, so I mean... Frost Giants are still out there and everything, so who knows, like, what, whether anything could come about that or not. It still makes you wonder about the whole Nine Realms situation, because we can't forget that that's still a thing, so. Right? And the means of, like, they're still probably, I mean, especially now that Asgard's kind of out of the picture. I mean, to be fair, that's also only Nine Realms. Let's not forget there's the whole multiverse that we kind of got introduced to with Doctor Strange, like, what that can eventually come up to be and what that means bleeding in with like like I say cosmic stuff like Thor and Captain Marvel. Also there was that thing I completely forgotten about and I, maybe I missed it the first time through is when Hela's going to look for the internal flame she ends up seeing like oh everything in here is fake and she knocks over an infinity gauntlet. I'm sure that was supposed to be a joke but it's like well no he couldn't have gotten it so it's like I, I, I like it's one of those things where it's like it's just a throwaway joke but part of me wonder is like why would you have that anyway is it just kind of like obviously everything is in her fake it's one of those things like stop thinking about the joke too much it's just a throwaway joke of like hi ah, isn't this funny and it is but still and you also can't forget about your boy scourge which is an interesting thing he just kind of was like 
taking over Heimdall's spot, trying to woo the ladies, and then he just kind of let things slide with Hela because he was trying to save his own hide. But he came through in the end, I guess. I mean, it makes you wonder, it's like, uh, can I be okay with you doing that? Like, should you be kind of heroed as a hero? I was like, no, nah, you kind of were a douchebag and sat back and she massacred a lot of your people. But it's like, you came through in the end, so that counts, right? People saw your sacrifice, right? For Asgard, right? It's like, I don't know, like, in retrospect, now sitting here through it a second time, I'm like, I feel for you, bro. It's like, oh, you did good in the end, but it's like, I don't know, man. I mean, to be fair, it's like, that's so different from Loki. Loki's always kind of done bad in me, and it's like, all right, all right, I'll, I'll come through in the end, like, when it's necessary, like he's done time and time again. He's literally did it multiple times in this movie. He literally did it in Thor 2, so, I mean, as in Thor 2, 2, as in Thor 2, also. <laughs> Nevertheless. But yeah, like I said earlier, still running through it. Thor is Thor Ragnarok is still a great movie. So, but uh, next up in the MCU rewatch is Black Panther. Uh, that will be the finale because I have caught up to everything at this point in time. So uh, this is what I need to rewatch up to this point. So it's gonna be interesting, especially because I feel like Black Panther is a lot fresher in my mind than a lot of the other movies, but still, I'm pretty sure like probably rewatching it the second time through, there's gonna be some things. There's definitely something um, I'm going to comment on, but I'll wait for like the Black Panther rewatch uh, before I talk about that exact thing. But really, that's all I want to talk about in this video. To the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, with life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and good bye.